name is Dr. Kent Ackerman, and uh, I'm a, a veterinarian at King West Vet Clinic in Toronto. And uh, I used to run a $24 million wildlife hospital, so I know a fair amount about exotics. I start with that introduction because there's a procedure I'm about to do, which is very well known in the exotic community for anal gland sacculectomies. And instead of doing the on-block excision of anal glands, which is the standard way of doing it in dogs and cats, in ex the exotic world for ferrets, we learned 20 years ago how to do anal gland sacculectomies by just doing a circumferential excision of the duct and taking the gland out through the duct incision, which ends up cosmetically much more exceptional than doing a large incision on the body of the gland. Part, we've uh, prepped the anus and we put gauze inside the rectum and before any of this we gave the animal a enema um, this morning and also he's been NPO'd for food for 24 hours and we withheld water after midnight last night. So no food for 24 hours. Uh, enema this morning and then some um, gauze in the rectum to decrease any contamination with final prep on the gauze. Okay. And then full prep sterile procedure after that. Here you can see the two ducts, it's the papillae. They're very obvious and we have inserted in the papillae to make it easier some dental amalgam which solidifies it makes a little bit of a pouch there and a little bit of a pouch here because the glands are here and here okay now the procedure is technically quite difficult but easy to explain so the first thing you do is you grab and pinch the duct with a forcept and you make a circumferential excision of just the skin so you want to use your hands like this so it's very gentle pressure you want to include the whole duct and you don't have to make a large incision I'll tell you why immediately you can see and this is true for dental for spays as well your incision can be quite small but once you've done the procedure of the, ex of the incision, the tissue then will stretch and be much wider. So you can have a small incision that stretches, and then when you sew it back together, it becomes small again. So your initial incision can be about half the size that you think. There we go. Now at this point, this is the hard part. You need to pull the skin away from the duct, which is not not so so hard okay and then you want to identify the gland which is in my finger here I can feel it okay it's right there in between my fingers and then you're gonna see a white glistening tissue and that's the gland there but depending on the blood pressure of the animal that white glistening tissue could be muscle so you want to dig a little deeper because you want to take, see all that muscle there, right there? That's all muscle. You don't want to include that in your excision. So you want to push all the muscle away from the gland. It's going very well. Can you get a really good close-up right there? Okay. So you can even undermine like this. Sometimes it's better to use a hemostat so you can get in there and undermine that overlying tissue. Okay, so um, let me just show you. What can happen is the duct can start tearing away and then you gotta grab it below the tear so you keep the duct completely intact. Okay. Now, the other thing I've done, which I didn't mention, is I've emptied the anal glands 
before I've, I've done this procedure to minimize any contamination. I'll just grab any material that's in there and throw that gauze away. Then we're going to start to dissect away. Now I'm not sure if it's easier or harder than it looks. But you can't be aggressive. You just have to be diligent. And I say it that way because being aggressive means you'll break into that sack. And if you get too aggressive, then your job is twice as hard because now you're working with a broken anal gland sack. If you're a little more patient, then the ending of this procedure is much more satisfying. Can you see that right there? Here's an example of where I'm getting a little too close to the inner lining of the sack. Right there's a little dark colored. And so I'm going to not be as aggressive at that point. Here is striated muscle. I can pull that away back to the animal. There's an example of it starting to rip right there. And that's okay. Not all is lost. All you do is grab below the rip and you're good to go. So here's an example of the, the gland tissue right there. It's a little bit darker than you'd expect. That means you're getting fairly thin tissue around there and that's fine. We're getting very close. There we go. When it starts ripping away, I tend to let go. I don't want it to rip hard. As soon as it releases, I let go and see what I've done. I can always go back to it. One thing I, don't, I teach my students that shadow me is try and keep your elbows in if you can. So using more your wrists. So the position of the patient is pretty important to make it easier on your back, but also easier to do the job. Now this happens to be a cat, which is a lot harder of a procedure than a dog, because the dog, the gland is much bigger and more obvious. Now if you do this procedure on a ferret, it's even harder, because the glands are again smaller, the ferret weighs usually less than a kilogram. So you can imagine how small those glands are. Now at the same time, pound for pound, they're more developed in a ferret. So in that sense, that helps a little bit too. Now you have to go circumferential, so I go in the inside now. There's a little bit of tissue there. As long as I haven't invaded the gland, I know that tissue needs to stay with the surgical patient. Once you slowly get rid of the attachments to the base of the gland, then the gland comes out in one piece. So the gland is taken out intact. So that's the only the tissue you're taking out. So you see that? Now the incision is that little tiny small incision. It may stretch and be bigger during the surgery, but it'll stretch back to its normal size. And again, in the cat, that's the size of the gland. It's not very big. 